Good evening tributes and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope everyone is well and that you're having a great week wherever you are. Before we begin, I'd like to give my usual thanks to Andrew McLean for all the art in this episode and all the art that he has provided since the reclamation. I'd also like to thank my Patreons. Your financial pledge is really appreciated. Another thing I'd like to mention is the Discord for the Hunger Games, where games are created based on your decisions. The links to both this Discord and my Patreon are found in the description, along with plenty of other links that are associated with this series. Now without further ado, let's go. The 92nd Games took place in the year 104. After a rather bland reaping in District 12, Gif Schneider and his entourage made their way straight to District 11. He met with Mayor Vickers and other officials, but after being treated to a small portion of the district's specially made whiskey, it was clear that Gif had become slightly inebriated, and it was therefore suggested that they begin the reaping as soon as possible. Once the large population of District 11's youths had been gathered into place, and Mayor Vickers had finished his speech, Gif walked to the female reaping bowl, carefully placing his cane against it, before thrusting his hand inside. He subsequently pulled out a piece of paper, which he announced to belong to 12-year-old Delphine Dubois. Tense sounds were heard throughout the crowd when they heard the age of this tribute. Although there seemed to be some confusion among the camera team as to where Delphine was stood, Eugenia quickly spotted a girl at the front of the enclosure, with vibrant mahogany braids, laced with bright green embellishments, but a plain, tatty lime dress. Delphine was now being stared at by the other girls around her, who were slowly backing away. Yet instead of walking to the platform, Delphine waited and looked to the back of the enclosure. But as the silence continued, she seemed to panic, and the peacekeepers quickly grabbed her by the shoulder before leading her to the platform. Tears fell from Delphine's face as she shook hands with Gif. He then marched over to the male reaping bowl and thrust his hand deep within, before picking out a piece of paper whom he announced to belong to 16-year-old Bloom Jetson. The camera quickly panned in on a rather plain lad with dark ashy skin and a simple side parting, who was adorned in a dark green suit that was clearly in need of repair. Bloom sighed in an apparent sorrow and the boy next to him put his hand on Bloom's shoulder before giving him a bittersweet smile. Within seconds, he was being escorted down the aisle to the platform. Once there, he shook Gif's hand before the citizens of District 11 were dismissed and Gif, Bloom and Delphine made their way down the path behind him, towards the town hall. Once Delphine and Bloom had been sequestered by peacekeepers in their parting rooms, Delphine's two older brothers, Serge and Gerard, came to visit her. Delphine continued to cry and hold her head in her hands, while Serge and Gerard quietly mouthed to each other to say something comforting towards Delphine, but neither seemed able to think of anything to console her. Furthermore, Serge was clearly very drunk, and he began to cry as he tried to comfort Delphine, but he and Gerard gradually began to make some sense, and they told Delphine that she should hide when she entered the games and wait for the other tributes to die off. However, Serge soon became angry when he appeared to realise what his sister was about to go through, and after a violent outburst towards one of the peacekeepers, he had to be removed. Delphine was able to have a quick embrace with Gerard, before being escorted to the station and onto the train. As for Bloom, his parents had clearly been drinking before they came to visit him, with his mother tripping slightly as she walked into the room, yet they both managed to get out enough words to remind Bloom to be confident, and his father told him to keep his chin up. His mother then tried to give him some monies, which she claimed were for the train, but after dropping these monies on the floor, the peacekeepers realised how inebriated Bloom's parents were, and they were subsequently removed, amidst tears and screams from both them and Bloom. He and Delphine were escorted to the main carriage of the train, and the journey to the capital began. Bloom initially tried to make small talk with Delphine, by asking what she thought of the furniture in this carriage, and how nice it was to see the lands outside District 11, which neither of them had ever seen before. But Delphine soon told Bloom that she was not interested in talking. He seemed slightly surprised by Delphine's blunt attitude, but she soon apologised and said that she was just feeling shocked by what had happened, especially given that she only had her name in once. Bloom said that he understood, and was sorry for Delphine having been chosen, but just as she turned her head to look back out the window once more, the pair's mentors entered the carriage. Geranio Landry and Easter Rollicks introduced themselves, explaining that Geranio would be Bloom's mentor, whilst Easter would be that of Delphine. They then said that they would like to speak to their mentees individually, which Bloom and Delphine agreed to. 
but whilst Easter was about to sit down with Delphine, he accidentally tripped against his chair, which made Geranio laugh from the other side of the carriage. Bloom also noticed this, and said that he could smell the whiskey on Geranio's breath, before loudly exclaiming that Geranio and Easter should not be drunk when they were supposed to be mentoring him and Delphine. Yet within a second of saying this, Geranio had punched Bloom on the nose, and yelled that he could not judge either of them until he had gone through what they had. Bloom's nose started to bleed, and Geranio composed himself before asking if he was ready to listen. Bloom seemed slightly shaken, but nodded in affirmation, and Geranio ordered the Avox present to grab tissues for his nose. As for Delphine, she stayed completely still during this altercation, but just as Easter was about to talk about the parade, she asked if she could have some whiskey as well. Easter looked at her in amusement, before laughing out loud and stating that if she won, she could have as much whiskey as she wanted, but not a drop of it until then, which seemed to sadden her once more. The men proceeded to speak to their mentees about what would be the best way to make a positive impression over the coming week. Although Delphine was clearly becoming more and more phased by what she was hearing, she still seemed to be listening carefully, until the food was brought in and she and Easter proceeded to eat. Easter appeared rather surprised by how quickly Delphine was eating, but when she noticed his surprised expression, he told her to not stop on his account. Bloom, on the other hand, remained rather sullen after his conflict with Geranio. He appeared less and less engaged by what he was hearing, and after openly yawning out loud, Geranio said that if Bloom was this abrasive around the other tributes, they would definitely mark him as an early target. Yet after they had eaten, Bloom appeared incapable of spending any more time around Geranio, and so he headed to his carriage. As evening set in, Delphine spoke to Geranio as well about what he would advise her to do in the games, and he and Easter decided that it would be best to show Delphine their respective games. The trio therefore proceeded to watch the highlights of the 77th and 83rd Hunger Games. Delphine appeared intrigued by what she saw, and she noted that they both won with the help of their allies, Millet for Easter and Lavender for Geranio. Easter stated that this was correct, but that someone could easily win without an ally, and that Bluebell Jansen was an example of this. However, when Delphine asked who this was, Geranio and Easter looked at each other in amazement, before bursting into laughter and telling Delphine that it was time for her to go to bed. Shortly after the tributes from District 12 had left Snow Station the next morning, the train for District 11 was instructed to complete the final 10-minute journey into the station. During this time, Easter and Geranio prepared their mentees for the awaiting crowds in the station, and Geranio said to Bloom that they would put yesterday behind them, and that this was Bloom's second chance. Once they pulled into the station, Easter and Geranio received rapturous applause when they dismounted from the train, with some outgoing citizens asking how their heads felt today, and the pair pretended to be nursing hangovers. Bloom then walked onto the platform, and he seemed pleased to pose with many capital citizens, not even tiring after having to take a total of 47 pictures with one old lady, who did not seem to understand how her camera worked. Bloom was also asked if he would pose for a picture with Geranio. Bloom seemed rather hesitant to this request, but Geranio quickly stepped in, holding him close to his side as they posed. Geranio was even heard by some to whisper, Smile! to Bloom, which had the desired effect. As for Delphine, many capital citizens seemed to find her strangely adorable, and she also posed for pictures. One woman touched Delphine's braids, saying that they were magnificent, and this made her jolt around and give a dirty stare to this woman. But after looking at Easter, he gave Delphine a sympathetic smile, and appeared to mouth the word, Sponsor. Delphine then let out a wry smile, and asked the woman if she would like to know how she braided her hair like this, and the crowd became intrigued by Delphine's explanations, which prompted Easter to smile and give her a nod of approval. After arriving in their apartment at the accommodation quarters, Geranio and Easter allowed their mentees some time to examine their bedrooms and the sheer size of the apartment. Their stylist, Claudius Creed, was subsequently brought in and Geranio introduced him, whilst Easter told Delphine that this was Bluebell Jansen's grandson, to which she asked if this was the legs woman. Easter glared at Delphine, but it was clear that he was trying not to laugh, and when he looked in bemusement towards Geranio, the pair briefly stifled their laughter before bursting into hysterics. Claudius looked at Delphine in a perplexed manner, before grinning slightly and saying that this was correct. Amidst his laughter, Easter asked how Delphine knew this, but she giggled and confessed that she had watched these games on the screen in her carriage after she had been sent to bed. Once this commotion had died down, Claudius and his co-stylist took Bloom and Delphine's basic measurements. As this was occurring, the group watched the reapings from District 5 onwards. Whilst Delphine watched, with more and more apparent dread, 
Bloom spoke to Claudius and they bonded over their interest of fashion and outfit design. Yet when Claudius mentioned that he had met his husband, Ulysses, at the Maclean School of Design, Bloom seemed slightly disheartened and Claudius excused himself to talk to his team. Whilst they spoke at the other end of the room, Delphine whispered, ouch, and grinned at Bloom, which seemed to annoy him. Easter laughed and stated to Delphine that she was a little savage, but Geranio whispered that if Bloom was going to flirt with anyone, it should be someone who could help him more directly. After a few more minutes of discussion with his team, Claudius announced that Bloom and Delphine would be dressed in a suit and dress made from bright green ivy laced with yellow and orange flowers. Over the next few hours, Claudius and his team made the pair stand completely still as more and more ivy strands and their flowers were added until the outfits were complete. Delphine seemed relatively pleased with her dress and asked for some of the flowers to be placed in her hair. Claudius obliged and asked if this was so she could look even more adorable but Delphine seemed rather confused by this question. Bloom, on the other hand, asked Claudius if his suit jacket could be kept closed, as it made his figure more appealing. Yet Claudius smiled and quietly replied that if his jacket was open, it would show more of the garments beneath, and that if he and his husband wore jackets, they both preferred to leave them open before winking and walking back to his team. Shortly before the parade took place, the tributes were led to their carriages that were lined up according to their district numbers. Bloom and Delphine seemed rather intrigued by the outfits that belonged to the other tributes, and as they mounted their carriage, Bloom seemed particularly captivated by the designs of the tributes in front of them from District 10. However, Jessica, from 10, soon shouted at Bloom to stop looking at her, to which he fired back that he had no desire to look at someone who dressed as a demented pig, and that he was looking past her. Geranio seemed rather amused by this altercation, but quickly told Bloom to stop. Yet just as Jason, from 10, was climbing down from the carriage and marching towards them, his mentor, Michele Onassis, pinched him still by the shoulder, and as he squealed in pain, she whispered to him to save it for the arena before glaring at Bloom. The parade started soon after and went by smoothly. Bloom and Delphine's outfits were well received, although it was Amadeus and Prospera, both from 2, who won Anderson Fashion's Best Dressed, for their outfits made entirely of golden feathers. They narrowly beat Deck and Nancy, both from four, who were also commended by the magazine for their flowy blue fabrics that resembled waves of the sea. The training began early the next day, and after a brief talk from Ennius Dalton about the rules of respect and conduct, the tributes were permitted to choose where they would train. Bloom and Delphine spent most of the first day practicing at the plant station, where they shared their knowledge of various plants and the healing and poisonous concoctions that could be created with them. Yet Bloom also watched the sword station very carefully, where Carrot and Solieris, both from one, spent almost the entire day fighting and sharing advice with each other on how to defend themselves. Delphine jokingly said to Bloom that he should offer to fight one of this pair for some practice, but when Solieris looked over with an inviting smile, Bloom immediately looked down and pretended to crush up a plant before whispering to Delphine to be quiet. The next day, Bloom and Delphine began in the station, but Bloom soon moved to the survival station, where he and Geds, from a six, attempted to build a shelter from branches, although without much success. As for Delphine, she seemed rather intrigued by what Lumo, from three, was doing in the electric station. Yet just as she seemed to be about to ask him how he was powering the circuit in front of him, Malcolm, from seven, accidentally threw a spear past Delphine's head, and although Malcolm was soon tasered by Ennius himself, Delphine was clearly scared by this, and spent the rest of the day appearing rather shaken whilst hiding in the camouflage station. The next day was the assessment of training scores, and Bloom and Delphine were two of the last tributes to show their skills. Bloom demonstrated a broad knowledge of various plants, and even created what he claimed was a toxic cocktail from the seeds of six different plants. Ennius allegedly asked how Bloom knew this creation was poisonous, to which Bloom replied that he was welcome to try it. Mild laughter was heard behind Ennius, who looked rather surprised, but Bloom proceeded to add, with all due respect, before leaving the assessment room. Delphine, on the other hand, only managed to identify several different plants from their outlines, descriptions, and colours. When asked if she could create something poisonous, she seemed upset to have to admit that she could not, but Ennius seemed slightly amused by this, before ending the session. When Bloom and Delphine watched the unveiling of the training scores in their apartment that evening with their mentors and Claudius, it was revealed that Bloom had scored a six, whilst Delphine had only scored a four. The highest scorers were Solieris from one, Amadeus from two, Malcolm from seven, and Lawrence from fourteen, who each scored a ten, 
whilst Huawei from 3, Chantilly from 8, and Eli from 14 each scored a 3, with the remaining scores scattered evenly between these extremes. Draneo said that this was good enough, and Easter quickly suggested opening a bottle of whiskey in order to celebrate these scores, although Delphine seemed confused by how her score was apparently good enough to celebrate. This time, Blue asked if he could have some whiskey, but the mentors looked at each other before bursting into laughter and rejecting Bloom's request. However, Easter ordered the Avox present to bring in some capital cake, which made both Bloom and Delphine very happy. As the group indulged in their respective delicacies, Geranio admitted that he may have misjudged Bloom, and that he never gave up, which made Bloom smile sheepishly. Claudius also said that this was a quality of Bloom's personality that would serve him well once the games began, before winking at him. The group's festivities continued, with Easter and Geranio becoming increasingly inebriated before they sent Delphine to bed. Bloom soon found it almost impossible to understand what Easter and Geranio were saying, and when Geranio tripped over a sofa, Bloom and Claudius made their way to the balcony in order to escape Easter's laughter and the heavy smell of tobacco that was now wafting through the apartment. Approximately half an hour later, Bloom and Claudius re-entered the apartment, and Claudius recommended that Bloom go to bed, whilst he and the Avox present worked together, in order to hoist Geranio and Easter onto the sofas in the main room of the apartment, where they slept that night. For the final day before the games, Bloom and Delphine were dressed in shiny emerald garments, along with flowers in Delphine's hair that were identical to those that were used for the parade, so that they were ready for the interviews. The career tributes interviews went by as normal, although when Eugenia tried to get them to give their true opinions on the careers from the other district, neither of the four appeared that bothered, and stated that they had hardly noticed their fellow careers. However, Amadeus from 2 went into detail about how he looked forward to smashing as many brains as possible, which even seemed to make Eugenia recoil slightly in horror. Huawei from 3 seemed extremely nervous, and halfway through her interview, Eugenia simply dismissed her, saying that she was bored, which made the crowd laugh. Malcolm from Seven intrigued the crowd when he spoke about his reasons for volunteering and that he looked forward to bringing glory to his district after it had gone for too long without a victor. As for Celio from Nine, Eugenia noticed his bulging muscles through his beige shirt and she continually asked him to flex his arms, which made the audience laugh. Eugenia began Delphine's interview by speaking to her in a manner that is common for the younger tributes, but after a few minutes, Delphine asked why she was being so nice, and if it was simply because Eugenia thought she was going to die soon. For once, Eugenia was rendered speechless, and the audience laughed at this honest question from a tribute. Yet she asked Delphine if she wanted her to be more direct, to which Delphine nodded. Eugenia quickly asked her what she thought were her chances of winning, and Delphine fired back, low but not impossible. Without stopping, Eugenia asked what Delphine most regretted that she would never be able to do in the future, to which she replies, drink whiskey. Eugenia let out a quick titter, before asking Delphine what advice her parents would give her once she was in the arena, and without taking a breath, Delphine replied, they're dead, but they tell me to run for my life. After this quick line of questioning, the audience laughed and cheered, with Eugenia pretending to look exhausted, and Delphine grinning at the reaction she had just caused. Once the sound of the audience had ended, Eugenia pretended to catch her breath, and stated that she wished every interview were that quick, which garnered more laughter, and the interview was ended shortly afterwards, with Easter apparently telling Delphine later that she had done well. The next interview was that of Bloom, and he began by timidly telling Eugenia that he very much liked her outfit, but even though Eugenia thanked him for this compliment, he seemed to go back into his shell shortly after, and Eugenia struggled to get many more answers from him, which led to the audience clearly becoming rather bored by this interview. She even called him Bloomer by accident as he left the stage, which triggered awkward laughter from the audience. Game maker Artulia Fling had her usual final interview, but rather unusually, she began her interview by offering up the information to Eugenia that this year's arena was not as horrible as the year before, which appeared to relieve many of the tributes. After a few more questions from Eugenia, Artulia stated that she and her construction team were still working out some final details, but after some surprised sounds from the audience, she quickly followed that this was deliberate, as she wanted to see what this year's tributes were like, before deciding on the final designs. As soon as the tributes and their mentors had arrived back in their accommodation quarters later that evening, Easter ordered Delphine to go to bed, whilst he and Geranio sat down with Bloom. Although the Avox present was sent to the corridor outside, she later reported that shouting was heard from inside the apartment, but it was not known what was being discussed. The next day, all tributes were taken to their holding rooms, 
where they were dressed in dark lycra suits that had their district numbers on the right breast, along with black plimsolls for their feet. Easter said to Delphine that she had the power to win, and that they would have a drink together once she won, but as he embraced Delphine, he gave a resigned smile to the camera on the wall behind her. Delphine then entered her tube, and Easter nodded to her in a reassuring manner as it rose into the arena. As for Bloom, he appeared most bothered by what he was made to wear, but just as he started whipping himself into a frenzy about having to wear the suit, Geranio grabbed him by the arms and told him to be careful and keep an eye out. Geranio then shook Bloom's hand and wished him good fortune as he entered his tube, which subsequently rose into the arena. This year's games took place in a flooded rainforest. There had been some debate between Game Maker Fling and her construction team as to how much water should be pumped into the arena and how deep it should be, but it was eventually decided during the night before the games that the water should not be a constant hazard throughout the games, and therefore most of the arena only contained knee-high water. Furthermore, a fair amount of raised grassy land was scattered throughout the arena, which was slightly smaller than most of those in recent years. There were also countless trees placed all over the arena, many of which were thin enough for tributes to climb, and hence used to their advantage. However, this high density of trees, along with the thick canopy of foliage above, trapped a lot of heat within, whilst blocking out light from above, which was certainly thought to affect tributes to some degree throughout these games. The cornucopia stood in the centre of a small circular clearing, which was one of the few areas in the arena to not contain any trees. The tributes podiums were placed in a semicircle along the southern side, with the depth of the water between them and the cornucopia being what Eugenia described as ankle height, which was designed to not hinder the tributes' movements when they began to run. A decent amount of supplies were placed between the podiums and the cornucopia, although the vast majority were placed in dark green circular bags that stopped tributes from seeing what was inside them, or even guessing their contents by the shape. Within the cornucopia, the only weapons present were twelve small axes, which gently floated on top of the water. As the podiums rose into the arena, many tributes actually seemed relieved, with Ennius joking that they were probably pleased to not be in another garbage heap. Yet they soon seemed to notice the heat, and realised why they were wearing such light clothing, before Game Maker Fling wished that the odds be in the tribute's favour, and she began the countdown from 30 seconds. Bloom from 11 was placed on a central left podium between Carrot from 1 and Nancy from 4. As Bloom looked into the cornucopia and noticed the axes, he also appeared to notice Carrot from the corner of his eye, who was eyeing him up and down whilst grinning maliciously, probably in an effort to intimidate him. However, Bloom continued to look at the bags, and like many other tributes, he seemed perplexed by what may be inside. As the countdown went through 10 seconds, he gradually leaned forwards on his podium in order to run. As for Delphine, she was placed on a far right podium between Lumos from 3 and Jessica from 10. She did briefly cast her eyes over the cornucopia and the supplies that lay before it, but when the countdown reached 10 seconds, she looked further along to her right and saw Amadeus from 2. He winked when he made eye contact with Delphine, and judging by her body language, it became obvious to both Amadeus and viewers upon a rewatch that Delphine would flee when the countdown hit zero. The gong subsequently sounded, and Delphine was one of five tributes to sprint away from the cornucopia and into the rainforest that lay behind her. As Delphine ran between the trees, she spotted Huawei from three, running to her left, and appearing to think that Huawei was now heading towards her, Delphine sprinted even quicker through the forest, but towards her right. Bloom, on the other hand, ran straight towards the cornucopia when the gong sounded. Like other tributes, he immediately went to grab a bag, before picking up one of the nearest that seemed slightly heavier than the others. Yet just as Bloom was about to continue forwards, he felt a hand clasp onto the back of his lycra suit. He jolted round to see Watt from Five, who appeared to have been eyeing this bag very carefully during the countdown. However, just as Watt tried to snatch the bag, Bloom quickly brought it round against the side of his head, which resulted in a metallic sound and Watt collapsed into the water. Bloom wasted no more time and continued ahead, but after five seconds of running, he saw that Soliris from One already had two axes in her hands, which she was aiming at other tributes. As she threw an axe that hit the girl from Seven, Bloom ran at an angle to grab another bag, whilst holding the one that he had already taken as a kind of shield. He managed to grab another bag, which seemed to be lighter, but just as he looked ready to run, he was hit with the blood of Carpo from Eight, who had been about to bring down an axe upon Chantilly from Eight. But when Bloom looked ahead, 
he realised that Prospera from two had just thrown this axe all the way from the mouth of the cornucopia to the back of Carpo's head, thereby inadvertently saving Chantilly, who scarpered away as quickly as she could. Bloom looked back and noticed the axe that now lay in Carpo's shaking hand, but as he looked ready to run towards it, he noticed that Ellie from 14, who had been fighting Deck from 4 for a different bag, suddenly spotted this axe as well. Bloom sprinted forwards, and although Ellie was slightly nearer, Deck punched her to the ground, which allowed Bloom to grab the axe with no contest. Deck suddenly noticed Bloom grabbing the axe, and through the screams and chaos that came from nearer to the cornucopia, Ellie could be heard calling him an Egypt. Bloom seemed tempted to attack them with the axe, but another suddenly came flying through the narrow distance between himself and Deck. Bloom and Deck then seemed to realise that it was not worth fighting each other, and they fled in opposite directions through the rainforest, whilst Ellie finally grabbed the bag that she had originally been fighting for, and she ran away as well. As Bloom darted between the trees, he appeared to notice that the water was becoming deeper, but he also seemed pleased that there were tufts of grass and raised land throughout, which meant that he would be able to rest if he needed. Once Bloom had been running and then jogging for about 15 minutes, he sat down on a small mass of land that lay above the water's surface. He listened carefully and noticed that he could no longer hear the screaming that had emanated from the cornucopia. After resting for a minute and catching his breath, Bloom noticed the bags that he appeared to have forgotten he was holding. He opened the second that he had taken to find a portion of fruit and he seemed pleased. He was then clearly intrigued to open the one that he had used as a weapon against Watt, and as he pulled out a canister of what turned out to be boiling water, he looked at the copious quantities of water around him and appeared extremely perplexed. However, Bloom simply shrugged off the random nature of this supply, placing the canister and the fruit into one bag, whilst carrying the axe in his other hand. As he was about to set off, he heard six cannons sounding, which meant that there were still twenty tributes remaining. Meanwhile, Delphine had continued running through the forest, and as she began to hear the first tributes dying, she appeared to panic and run faster, whilst tears started falling from her eyes. After a minute, she tripped on a tree stump and into the water, but as she got back up, she heard Nancy from four, screaming and shouting, Get off me! as she approached from behind. Delphine started to get up from the water, whilst looking back to see that Nancy was being chased by a blue and yellow bird with a large beak and eyes that was pecking at her hair. Eugenia explained that the bird was known as a macaw, and seemingly not wanting to be its next target, Delphine quickly fled through the forest from where it was attacking Nancy. Viewers saw Nancy fall into the water just seconds later, and she became submerged, but this actually stopped the macaw from being able to attack her. After briefly coming up for air, Nancy took a large breath and lay back beneath the surface once more, this time holding her breath for almost three minutes, which was enough time to see the macaw fly away. It amused the audience that as the macaw flew away, it squawked, GET OFF ME! in the same tone that Nancy had shouted. After 20 minutes had passed, Delphine finally came to a stop, before crouching down behind a tree and resting. Six cannons sounded, and she appeared relieved to have at least survived the start of these games, yet as she began to hear the macaws mimicking sounds approaching from behind her, she travelled onwards, and approximately two hours later, she reached the perimeter. As for Bloom, he had continued through the forest after hearing the cannons, often looking around and even upwards, presumably for any other tributes. Yet as the hour went by, he appeared to be moving through the forest at a more western angle, until he finally found a large mass of land, full of trees, plants and bushes which lay above the water. Bloom seemed elated, and ran through the water towards this land, before lying down and appearing to enjoy the dryness of the ground. He looked around at the trees and appeared to hear the macaws in the distance, but unlike most other tributes, he did not seem alarmed by their mimicking sounds. Yet just as he sat up, in order to take out a piece of fruit from his bag, an axe was suddenly thrown into the ground, exactly where his head had just been. Bloom jumped in shock when he looked up to see Jessica and Jason, both from ten, running towards him. He hurriedly yanked his bag from the ground before sprinting through the trees with his own axe at the ready, and Jason hurried Jessica to prise her axe out of the ground. Bloom breathed out heavily as he ran, before hearing Jason approaching and shouting that they were about to make a demented pig out of him. After running for almost a minute, Bloom seemed to hear Jason catching up on him, and when he was just 20 metres away, Bloom hid behind a tree, before holding the canister and then throwing the bag with great force into the water next to his tree. This sound caused a loud splash, along with ripples that flowed outwards, and Jason waited for Jessica to catch up. He put his finger over his mouth as she approached, 
but whilst the pair slowly walked towards the bag, which had just become visible to them through the trees, Bloom crept as quietly as he could towards another tree that lay just metres to the right. Jason and Jessica slowly neared the bag, and Jason quickly jumped around the side of the adjacent tree with his axe at the ready. He seemed a little disappointed to see that Bloom was not there, but he turned around, saying to Jessica that at least they had his supplies, and that he could not have gone far. Bloom breathed deeply from behind the nearby tree, and he seemed to close his eyes in concentration whilst listening to Jason. He then suddenly came out from behind the tree, and just as Jason spotted him, he threw his axe, which hit Jason in the left shoulder, and caused him to shout in pain as he fell into the water behind him. Jessica immediately jumped, and spotting Bloom, she appeared pleased to notice that he no longer had a weapon. She ran over to Jason, presumably to take their axe, which he had just dropped into the water as he fell, but before she could pick it up, Bloom ran closer to her, with the canister of boiling water at the ready. He held onto it, but pushed it towards the pair, which caused boiling water to fly against Jessica's face and Jason's shoulder wound. They both screamed in pain, and as Bloom ran towards them, Jessica held her wound with one hand, before trying to pick up the axe with the other. However, it was too late for her, and Bloom kicked her in the head, which saw her fall back into the water. He then grabbed his axe from Jason's wound, which caused Jason to scream, but Bloom stopped this sound by stabbing him across the throat. He then marched towards Jessica, who was now desperately clutching her face and trying to crawl backwards through the water. She briefly tried to appeal to Bloom's better nature, but with little to no hesitation, he slammed the axe into her throat. Within seconds, two cannons sounded, and Bloom grabbed his canister, fruit and axe, along with the bread and other axe that had belonged to Jason and Jessica, before putting all the supplies except for one of the axes into his bag and heading back to his previous resting spot. As the darkness of night set in, Delphine remained near to the perimeter, approximately 500 metres east of Bloom. However, just as she was about to fall asleep, she heard intense squawking from nearby, followed by two cannons, which were shown to viewers to belong to the tributes from District 12, after a rather feisty flock of macaws had gone astray and attacked them. When Delphine saw the hovercraft collect these bodies not too far from where she was resting, this appeared to worry her, and she quietly waded in the opposite direction and through the water, until she found two logs that lay near to each other. She proceeded to roll one towards the other, so that a small gap was created between the top of them, which was just about big enough for Delphine to rest inside. As for Bloom, he had been the focus of quite a lot of commentary between Eugenia and Ennius following his fight against Jason and Jessica. Ennius surprised Eugenia and many other viewers when he said that he had not seen Bloom touch an axe once during training. Eugenia then suggested that maybe he had wanted to keep his weaponry skills on the down low, so that other tributes would not attack him. Once tributes were beginning to sleep, Bloom hid beneath a large overhanging tree in the centre of this landmass. He ate some peaches and oranges from his fruit supply, but he appeared unable to drink anything due to the boiling temperature of the water that would scald his mouth. Yet after a few minutes, a sponsor gift was sent down for Bloom, which he quickly opened with great excitement to find a wooden bowl. This would not necessarily be very useful to most tributes, but Bloom quickly realised that he could pour the boiling water into this bowl, which would allow it to cool down and become drinkable. Interestingly, he hid the note that was attached to this gift, but he proceeded to drink the water from the bowl once it had cooled down, and as midnight approached, he began to sleep. Delphine, on the other hand, had not eaten or drunk anything since the games began, but she seemed unaffected by this as she lay in the gap between the logs. When Eugenia mentioned Delphine during the end-of-day analysis, Aeneas laughed and asked how long she would be able to go without food or water, but Eugenia quickly replied that the record for a tribute to go without either of these necessities was held by a female tribute from District 11, who had gone on to win her games. As Delphine started to fall asleep, Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of Watt and the girl, both from five, the girl from six, the girl from seven, Carpo from eight, the girl from nine, Jason and Jessica, both from ten, and both tributes from twelve were shown, meaning that ten tributes had been eliminated, while sixteen remained. Like most opening nights, some tributes slept much better than others, but unlike most opening nights, no tributes seemed affected by low temperatures, due to the heat that was still trapped by the tree's foliage, which had been heating the rainforest. After Bloom awoke, he briefly looked around, but when he did not notice any movement, he simply rested beneath the tree and readied some more of the boiling water in his bowl before eating some fruit. Delphine, on the other hand, had not slept very well, and she continuously awoke through the night. 
She was the last tribute to awaken during the mid-morning, and despite a few tributes walking near to her location, none of them spotted her wedged between the two logs. As Delphine looked around at the copious amounts of water, she begged for drink of water, and it soon became clear that she was dehydrated, but nothing arrived for her from sponsors. She seemed tempted to drink some of the water from the ground, but fortunately for her, she rejected this idea before she went through with it. Eugenia asked Ennius what would have happened to Delphine if she had tried to drink from this water, but just as he was saying that it would likely lead to nausea and diarrhoea, Eugenia interrupted and stated the tribute seemed to be cowering from something. Whilst Eugenia and Ennius were talking, strong winds had begun to flow east across the arena, and within a minute, their velocity increased to the point where it had become hard for tributes to walk against them. Delphine quickly nestled herself between the logs once more, and Bloom was almost swept out from beneath the tree into the nearby water, but he held on to the branches before trudging back towards the trunk of the tree itself and holding on. As the wind speed increased to the point that trees began to fall, Delphine cried and called for her brothers, while Bloom held onto the trunk of his tree. After a few seconds, a cannon sounded, which was shown to viewers to belong to Geds from Six, who had just been pinned down by a fallen tree within the water, which caused him to drown. Most tributes were relatively fortunate, and as the hurricane raged on for the next ten minutes, a few tributes saw trees falling near them, but none of them were actually hit, although Lawrence and Ellie, both from 14, narrowly avoided being hit by a tree by jumping out of its way and into the water. Delphine was almost hit as well, when a tree fell sideways onto the logs between which she was hiding. Although she screamed as she saw this tree falling towards her, it was rather hollow, and the higher part of the tree that fell beyond these logs simply broke off, narrowly missing Delphine and causing a V-shape with the logs in which she was resting. Delphine continued to cower from the vicious winds above her, but after approximately ten minutes, the winds gradually died out and the sunlight returned through the canopy of the trees above. She slowly peeked out from between the logs and surveyed the damage of the falling tree, before once again begging for water, although nothing arrived. Bloom's hair had been completely thrown askew by the hurricane, but as the sunlight returned, he brushed it back into place with his hands, before relaxing in exhaustion against the tree and eating an orange. Yet just as he was about to get up a few minutes later, a cannon sounded. This was shown to viewers to belong to Nancy from Four, who had only just come out of her shelter, but as she did so, she accidentally dislodged a stick, which caused a battered tree next to her to fall and crush her to death. As the morning turned to afternoon, most tributes stayed put, with many appearing to still be shaken by the effects of the earlier hurricane. Delphine began to walk east through the arena, seemingly in search of water. She narrowly avoided encountering Malcolm from Seven, who was sharpening one of his axes, just a hundred metres in front of where she was walking, but fortunately for her, his back was turned. Delphine also noticed the macaws flying above her, but rather wisely, she did not stop or even look at them, which caused them to ignore her and make no effort to attack. Yet just as Delphine was resting on a log, she spotted something moving quickly through the water towards her feet. She rapidly sat up on the log, just as a flat grey fish appeared at the water's surface and gnashed its small yet numerous teeth. This made Delphine yelp in horror as another one of these fishes that Ennius quickly identified as piranhas appeared in the water that lay directly in front of her. She watched in terror as more piranhas joined and gnashed in the water beneath her, with Eugenia rather interestingly informing viewers that a group of these fish was called a shoal. Delphine, who was unknowingly one of the first tributes to be attacked by these fish, carefully stood up on this log and desperately looked around for a way to escape, but the shoal had grown in size and the log was now surrounded. As Delphine looked around, she just about maintained her balance, although she suddenly gasped in terror when she heard a mimicking sound of her screams swooping into her right, and before she could even try to defend herself, a macaw was trying to peck her neck. Delphine was knocked back on the log, and after almost slipping off to her right, she used her hand to push off the floor, but was given a small bite on her wrist by a piranha, which made her yelp. The macaw then landed on Delphine's chest, before hopping excitedly towards her neck. As it neared her, she managed to catch it in her hands, and although it squawked and tried to free itself, she maintained her grip. Yet Delphine suddenly heard a flurry of the piranhas in the water to her right, and looked down to see them thrashing around in the water where the blood from her wound had dripped. Delphine appeared to contemplate, before looking at the macaw which was staring back at her in fright. It mimicked back, HELP ME! Which viewers had seen the girl from Twelve say shortly before she was pecked by this macaw. Tears formed in Delphine's eyes, but she sat up and smacked this macaw against the log, 
over and over again until it was bleeding. The piranhas to her right appeared to have devoured the blood that had previously spilt from her wound, but Delphine threw the flinching macaw into the water to her left, before bursting into tears and carefully standing up on the log. Her plan appeared to have worked, and the shoal of piranhas quickly swarmed round to the left side of the log as they devoured the macaw, but this gave Delphine enough time to escape, and she quickly fled back the way she had come, whilst appearing to try to spot any piranhas that lay in the water ahead of her. When Delphine spotted the V-shape of the logs where she had previously rested, she slowed down and seemed relieved to have made it back, but when she was just metres from reaching it, another cannon sounded, which was revealed to viewers to belong to Ellie from 14, when she tripped in the water and was bitten to death by a shoal of piranhas. After hearing the cannon and the distant screams, Delphine stopped in her tracks, but as she waited, she suddenly shrieked when she was bitten on her right ankle by another piranha. She then sprinted ahead, and despite receiving one more small bite, she managed to throw herself onto one of the logs in the V-shape without any further injury, although the piranhas were once again chasing after the blood that she had spilt in the water. Yet as Delphine looked back the way she had come in a mixture of bewilderment and exhaustion, she slowly tilted her head after seeing another log that lay just a few metres away from the open side of the V-shape. Eugenia stated that this was an idea face, and Delphine shuffled along the log amidst the gnashing of the piranhas in the water next to her, until she sat next to a sharp point that was sticking out of the log. Delphine closed her eyes and breathed slowly, before stabbing her hand down onto this sharp point and wheezing in pain as blood began to flow out. Viewers in Snow Square shouted in confusion as Delphine impaled her hand, but as Aeneas and Eugenia tried to work out what she was doing, she raised it over the point of the V-shape, which quickly attracted the piranhas, who gnashed around in the water after sensing Delphine's blood. Whilst the shoal was distracted, Delphine ran through the V-shape towards the log that lay perpendicular to the V-shape. She then winced as she began to roll it forwards, and it soon became clear to viewers that she was trying to form a triangle with this log and the two others, which would trap the piranhas. Even Ennius appeared rather impressed by this idea, but he asked how a young girl of Delphine's size was managing to push such a heavy tree through the water. However, Artulia quickly jumped in and answered this question from the control room, stating that although these trees had looked extremely heavy, there were some that were in fact rather hollow, most of which had been knocked to the ground during the earlier hurricane. Either way, Delphine panted in exhaustion as she continued to roll the log forwards, yet when the log was just a metre from the edge of the V-shape, a few piranhas appeared to have sensed the blood that was emanating from the wounds on Delphine's ankle, and they swam towards her. Delphine had almost managed to seal the V-shape into a triangle when she screamed in pain as a piranha bit the big toe on her left foot. She appeared to kick it away and tried to keep pushing the log, but another piranha bit her right heel and she gasped in pain. However, to many viewers' surprise, Delphine continued to push this log, despite the piranhas that were continuing to nip at her feet, and after 20 seconds of clear pain, she had managed to create a triangular piranha pit from these three logs. Delphine quickly got up and rested carefully upon one of the logs as she watched the piranhas gnashing against the water. She then grimaced in pain as she cut her other palm with the same sharp point that she had used earlier, before pouring more blood into the piranha pit. Delphine seemed relieved that the piranhas were continuing to fight within the triangle of logs, but she quickly ran to the nearest mass of land, before ripping off some smaller branches from the shorter trees, and over the next few minutes, she wedged these branches into the gaps beneath where the logs met presumably in an effort to stop any piranhas escaping from the triangular pit. After Delphine seemed certain that the piranha pit was sealed, she waded slowly back to the mass of land and lay down in exhaustion. Two more cannons sounded, which were shown to viewers to belong to Lumos and Huawei, both from three, after they had escaped from a shoal of piranhas, before running straight into Carrot and Soliris, both from one, who killed the pair within 30 seconds of seeing them. Yet Delphine hardly seemed to react to these cannons, and as she looked up, she appeared too weak to move, until she suddenly seemed to have a cramp all over her right side, which she clutched in pain. She then crawled behind a large bush before fainting in exhaustion. Meanwhile, Bloom had experienced a slightly easier time during the piranha attack, and he remained on the mass of land beneath a large tree. Shortly after hearing the cannon of Ellie from 14, Bloom looked out, but did not seem to react, although just as he was about to place some water into his bowl, he spotted a macaw flying down towards him. Bloom grabbed his axe and came out from beneath the tree, before swiping at the macaw's wing and causing it to fall to the ground. He seemed unshaken, but noticed the rest of this macaw's flock that were flying towards him, 
and he gathered his supplies before jogging west away from their direction of flight. The flock flew onwards, and it appeared to be a false alarm, but Bloom continued travelling across this mass of land, checking all the bushes, plants and trees that lay in his way. Half an hour went by and he heard the cannons of Lumos and Huawei, both from three, but he did not react. Yet a minute later, he stopped in shock when he spotted one of the few trees in the arena that contained fruit. Bloom picked a few leaves before placing them over his hands, and he even covered his mouth with his green bag, before plucking some of these light green fruits that looked like small apples. Eugenia informed viewers that they were called manchineal, and were allegedly so poisonous that even by breathing the air around them, one could be affected by their toxins. Bloom proceeded down to the bank with these fruits wrapped carefully within the leaves. He appeared pensive about what to do with them, until he heard shouting coming from ahead. He quickly ran behind a bush and looked out, before spotting Chantilly from eight, running from a shoal of piranhas to this mass of land. Bloom grinned and threw the manchineal fruits onto the ground next to the bush, before watching as Chantilly charged through the water and landed just metres from where he was hiding. She spluttered in tears as she examined her bites, but just as she appeared to be about to pass out from exhaustion, she looked to her right to see the manchineal fruits. Viewers had seen that Chantilly had not yet eaten anything since the games began, and it therefore came as no surprise that she joyfully sprang forward and grabbed these fruits with her bare hands, before devouring one within approximately 10 seconds, and then beginning the second. Yet just as she was about to finish this second manchineal, Bloom suddenly rose from behind the bush. Chantilly gasped as she saw him, but instead of attacking her or even saying anything, Bloom simply walked away in the opposite direction, back to where he had originally been resting. Chantilly was clearly bewildered by what had just happened, and she called out to Bloom as he walked away, but he simply ignored her. She then grabbed the fruit, and after checking that there were no piranhas present, she fled through the water in the opposite direction to Bloom. Yet as the afternoon turned into evening, Chantilly became upset when she noticed that her hands were beginning to blister. This upset soon morphed into agony as she appeared to experience trouble breathing, and this eventually turned into vomiting, before she passed out and experienced heart failure before dying. That evening, almost all the piranhas were removed from the arena, which meant that the waters were relatively safe to traverse once more. Bloom began heading back towards the centre of the arena, and just as it was becoming too dark to see where he was going, he was fortunate to find a small mass of land with some relatively leafy bushes, which he used to create a kind of bed. Bloom spent the next few minutes looking up at the stars, and another sponsor gift soon arrived, which this time was a box of matches and he was once again very careful to hide the attached note from the camera, even though it made him laugh, before placing it inside his bag. As for Delphine, she woke up after hearing Chantilly's cannon, and through the night vision cameras that had just been activated, it was clear that she was now extremely weak from dehydration. She tried to get up and her feet gave way, but she breathed deeply for a few seconds before rising to her feet and balancing herself against a tree. Delphine very carefully walked through the brief distance of water towards the piranha pit, and although she probably could not see them, she seemed pleased to hear the shoal gnashing away in the water between the logs. Yet just as Delphine appeared to be adjusting her eyes to the darkness, she noticed a small fire, roughly a hundred metres ahead of her. She looked in bewilderment, probably wondering why anyone would need to light a fire in this humid arena, until she appeared to notice that it was moving nearer to her, with viewers having seen that Soleris from one had lit a stick of wood earlier, which she was now using to guide her and Carrot's way through the rainforest. As they came nearer, Delphine closed her eyes and muttered to herself, before breathing deeply, and then creeping quietly around to the side of the piranha pit that was nearest to where this pair was approaching. She hid behind a tree that lay just metres away, and waited for them to come even closer, whilst the crowds in Snow Square became completely silent in anticipation for what was about to happen. When Carrot and Soliris were just ten metres away, Delphine suddenly ran out and looked at the pair with apparent fright on her face, illuminated by the fiery stick that Soliris was holding. Neither Carrot nor Soliris wasted any time in acting, with Soliris throwing her axe which clipped one of Delphine's braids. However, Delphine ran diagonally across their path, before using all her apparent strength to jump over the piranha pit, which she narrowly managed to clear, despite scuffing the back of her leg. Carrot and Soliris both chased after her, but they appeared too focused on chasing Delphine to notice the triangle of logs that had been placed within the water in front of them. Delphine continued to run ahead, but both Carrot and Soliris tripped over the log that lay in front of them, before falling straight into the piranha pit. 
As the sound of frantic splashing and gnashing began, Delphine threw herself behind a tree, before looking back as Solaris screamed in pain, whilst Carrot was knocked unconscious after his head hit another log, which caused him to be bitten by countless piranhas whilst unconscious. Solaris desperately tried to crawl from this deadly triangle, but the logs were too high to allow her to crawl out, and as the piranhas continued lashing around in the water, the sounds of her screams died out, soon followed by two cannons. As soon as these cannons sounded, Delphine limped over, before carefully grabbing Carrot's bag, which had fallen onto one of the logs, along with Solaris's axe, which had gone flying ahead when she initially saw Delphine. The hovercraft came to collect their bodies, and as Delphine waded away through the water, she cried with apparent joy after opening Carrot's bag and finding two bottles of water, some bread, fruit, and matches inside. She gently swigged from the bottle of water, and within a few minutes she had reached another small landmass, where she collapsed on a grassy mound with tears of joy and laughter. Although Delphine slammed her hand over her mouth after realising how loudly she had just laughed, this made her seem even more amused, and she happily consumed some bread, fruit, and more water. Eugenia and Ennius noted that Delphine's physical state seemed to be rapidly improving, and Eugenia admitted that she felt genuinely pleased for Delphine, who she claimed had deserved these supplies. A minor controversy was also triggered when Ennius incorrectly believed his microphone to be turned off, but was heard to say, Take that, Van Roosh, clearly referring to Estelle Van Roosh, the only living victor and mentor of District 1. An hour later, whilst Delphine was examining the axe that she had taken from Soliris, her situation improved even further when she was finally sent a sponsor gift. She gleefully opened it to see that it was a healing ointment, which she applied to the bites on her feet. Although it appeared to sting her slightly, she did not seem to care that much, and she fell asleep shortly afterwards, using her bag as a pillow. As for Bloom, he practiced throwing the axe against a nearby tree, until it became too dark, and shortly after midnight, he fell asleep. At midnight, the portraits of Carrot and Soleris, both from one, Lumos and Huawei, both from three, Nancy from four, Geds from six, Chantilly from eight, and Ellie from fourteen were all shown, which left only eight tributes remaining. These were Amadeus and Prospera, both from two, Deck from four, Malcolm from seven, Celio from nine, Bloom and Delphine, both from eleven, and Lawrence from fourteen. The next morning, all tributes were awoken early by the sounds of lightning and torrential rain. Delphine jumped as she awoke, before quickly checking her supplies and then trying to cover herself by holding her bag above her head. Although this appeared to keep Delphine dry at first, the water rose around her, and as the land mass upon which she was resting began to be covered in water, she realised that she should move if she wanted to be sheltered. Delphine started walking through the rainforest, but after a few minutes, a tree near her was suddenly hit by a bolt of lightning, which made her scream twice, once at the sound of lightning, and then again when the tree came crashing down in front of her. She ran to her left, clearly scared by the lightning, but within a minute, she spotted a high mass of land that lay ahead of her. Delphine struggled through the rising waters, but eventually made it to this land mass, before collapsing on its surface, with so much rain falling around her that she seemed incapable of seeing properly, but she clambered beneath a large tree, which helped to keep her relatively dry, and she proceeded to rest there for the next few hours. As for Bloom, he remained on his mass of land and appeared relatively unbothered by both the lightning and the rain. Over the next hour, he continued to eat his fruit and drink his water, whilst resting against a tree and looking straight ahead. Yet when Bloom appeared to be talking to himself, he suddenly twisted round to see Celio from Nine, standing just a few metres behind him with an axe in his hand. Viewers had seen Celio creeping towards Bloom for the last minute with his axe at the ready, and when Celio realised that he had been spotted, he charged forwards. He tried to smash the axe into the head of Bloom, who deflected the blow with his hand, which became cut in the process. Bloom shouted out in pain and he fell next to the tree, but while Celio crawled on top of him and tried to bring the axe down, Bloom pushed Celio's hand away with all the strength he seemed to possess. Bloom then knocked Celio's hand against the tree, which made him drop his axe and shout from the pain in his knuckles. Bloom quickly snatched the axe and slashed it across Celio's cheek, which caused him to fall to his side and into the water that was continuing to rise from the heavy rainfall. Celio tried to cover his wound before looking ready to flee, but Bloom hit his neck with the axe. He tried to hold his neck, but Bloom continued to slash at him with the axe, whilst angrily stating that Celio had cut his hand, 
along with many other words that needed to be censored during later broadcasts. A few minutes later, Celio's cannon sounded and his body was collected, whilst Bloom continued to rest on the land mass. Over the next hour, the rainstorm gradually settled, and Eugenia and Ennius spoke about what they had just seen, with Ennius admitting that Bloom was certainly the dark horse to win this year's games, but Eugenia playfully reminded Ennius that they could not discount anyone until they had died. As the morning turned to afternoon, most tributes rested from the effects of the rainstorm, whilst eating, drinking, and sleeping, in order to maintain their energy levels. Yet in the early afternoon, Gamemaker Fling made an announcement, in which she congratulated the tributes for making it this far, before declaring that a feast would be held in one hour within the cornucopia, and that each tribute would be gifted with something that they needed. Upon hearing this announcement, Delphine seemed extremely tempted to attend the feast, but after looking through her decent quantity of supplies, and apparently realising that it was not worth the risk, she simply sat back and shook her head, seemingly indicating that she would not attend. As for Bloom, he immediately got to his feet after hearing the announcement. He slowly made his way to the central clearing, whilst looking around very carefully, presumably for other tributes. He arrived by the clearing within 40 minutes, and waited on the eastern side, where he submerged himself beneath the water, only coming up when he needed to for short gasps of air. Eugenia stated that this was one method of hiding, but not as good a method as that of Malcolm from Seven, who had climbed a tree on the southern side of the clearing, from which he could see both the clearing itself and Amadeus and Prospera, both from Two, who were unknowingly stood below. Soon enough, the feast platform rose from the ground. Before it had even reached its full height, Deck from Four was racing through the western side of the clearing towards his bag, Ennius was surprised, but he also pointed out that Amadeus was preparing his axe. He threw it at Deck, who saw it flying towards himself at the final moment, which gave him time to throw himself to the ground. He then snatched his bag and began to run back through the western side of the clearing, away from Amadeus and Prospera, who were now both running towards him. Whilst this pair were distracted by Deck, Bloom took his chance and sprinted across the eastern side of the clearing towards the platform. As Prospera threw her axe and knocked Deck to the floor, Amadeus grabbed the feast bag for District 2, before looking around and spotting Bloom. He ripped Prospera's axe from Deck's head, before preparing it to throw at Bloom, who had just run north past the cornucopia, which stopped both Amadeus or Prospera from being able to target him. As Deck's cannon sounded, Amadeus ran around the cornucopia towards Bloom, before throwing his axe, but just as Bloom made his way into the surrounding rainforest, the axe hit a tree that lay just a few metres to his left. Prospera proceeded to defend the feast platform, whilst Amadeus ran after Bloom, who was continuously looking behind him as he ran, presumably having realised that he was being chased. Amadeus ran onwards, chasing what he thought were Bloom's footsteps, while shouting that he was going to smash Bloom's head in with the axe, and that he could not wait to destroy his brain. Yet after a few minutes of running between the trees, Amadeus seemed to realise that he had lost Bloom, and he repeatedly swore in frustration, before throwing his axe against a nearby tree. He closed his eyes and breathed out in anger, but just as he opened them again, an axe was thrust into his neck. Lawrence, from 14, told Amadeus that he should have shut up, before pulling his axe out from Amadeus's neck and leaving him to drop to the ground. As the cannon sounded, Lawrence grabbed the feast bag for District 2, before walking back through the rainforest towards the northern perimeter. Viewers saw that Amadeus had soon become disorientated by the thick density of the forest that surrounded the clearing, which saw him walk at the wrong angle just seconds after he had left the cornucopia clearing. However, Lawrence, who had been waiting to attend the feast, was hiding behind a tree that lay just metres from where Amadeus lost his temper, which made it easier to target him. Once Bloom had returned to his earlier resting spot, he checked the contents of the feast bag for District 11, to find some healing ointment inside for the cut that Celio had caused, along with a waterproof blanket that Ennius guessed was intended for Delphine if she had taken this bag. Whilst the feast had been taking place, Delphine continued to rest in the same place where she had sheltered from the storm, but as the darkness of night set in, she witnessed Malcolm walking past her hiding place. Delphine appeared to notice him looking towards the tree where she was hiding, but she held her breath as she hid behind it until Malcolm finally moved on. However, this close call appeared to worry Delphine, and after a few minutes had gone by, she slowly made her way inwards to the cornucopia. She managed to travel relatively quietly through the water, but after almost an hour, Bloom heard her walking approximately 20 metres to his left, 
and as he slowly readied his axe, Eugenia squealed with excitement. Bloom hid himself carefully behind a tree before spotting Delphine through the darkness, and over the next few seconds, he slowly crept through the water towards her, with his axe held firmly in the air. Yet just as Delphine began to hear Bloom approaching from a few metres away, she suddenly jumped and pulled out her own axe, but then crouched defensively in the water whilst whimpering. Although viewers could see through the night vision cameras that Bloom had his axe at the ready and was clearly about to hit Delphine, he suddenly stopped and said her name with an extremely bewildered tone. She then looked up with a glimmer of hope and said his name back at him with an almost equal level of amazement. A tense moment passed as Bloom appeared to realise that this was indeed Delphine, but he proceeded to lower his axe and he told her that he thought she was dead. Delphine slowly rose back up from the water and said that she thought Bloom was about to kill her. However, he seemed to ignore this comment and asked where she had managed to get the axe that she was holding. Delphine said that she would tell Bloom in due course, before asking him rather desperately if they could stay together, as there were now only a few others left, and they would have a better chance of surviving if they were together. Bloom appeared to think carefully about this, and a tense moment of silence passed in Snow Square as he made his decision, but he said that for this night only they would stay together, and Delphine appeared to let out a sigh of relief. The pair then spent the evening on the landmass where Bloom had been resting. They told each other what they had experienced so far, while sharing their food and discussing who their remaining opponents were. As Delphine appeared to become much more tired, Bloom said that he would take the first shift, whilst Delphine slept, and at midnight, the portraits of Amadeus from 2, Deck from 4, and Celio from 9 were shown in the sky, which left only Prospera from 2, Malcolm from 7, Bloom and Delphine both from 11, and Lawrence from 14 remaining. Shortly before the sun rose the next morning, a cannon sounded, which Bloom somehow slept through. However, Delphine awakened him and told him what she had just heard. It was shown to viewers that Lawrence had finally run out of energy and fallen asleep, but Malcolm, who had been spying on him for the last two hours, was now able to approach and kill Lawrence with his axe. As Bloom listened to what Delphine told him, he thanked her for letting him know, but said that whilst it was still dark, he wanted some more sleep. Delphine appeared happy to continue washing over Bloom, but just minutes after he had fallen back to sleep, she appeared to notice a light rain that was falling on them. The minutes went by and the night became day, but the rainfall started to intensify, which caused Bloom to awaken once more. A squawking was then heard from the perimeter, and Delphine quickly grabbed her axe, whilst Bloom began to stir in his sleep. Delphine looked at him with a curious expression in her eye, and Eugenia said that she was clearly tempted to kill him there and then. However, before Delphine could even attempt to kill Bloom, a flock of macaws suddenly dove down from the canopy of the trees above, while squawking a variety of final words for the tributes that they had killed, which mainly included pleas of mercy and anguish. Delphine screamed before running towards the cornucopia. She was chased by several of this flock, but she managed to wave her axe behind her enough to hit a macaw, and this seemed to dissuade the others from trying to follow her any further as she fled through the heavy rain. Bloom, on the other hand, only awoke once the macaws had begun to peck him, but he quickly pushed himself against the tree, whilst lashing his axe back and forth across the flock that were flapping around in front of him. Upon a slow-motion replay, Bloom was clearly pecked several times, but he managed to hit enough of the macaws to deter the surviving members of the flock, who flew away within a minute. Bloom then wasted no time and got up to run in the same direction that Delphine had, although as he moved, it became clear that he was bleeding heavily from the various places where he had just been pecked. He also appeared to become disorientated as he ran, and this was exacerbated by the opaqueness of the rainfall that was now hammering down upon the arena. Delphine continued sprinting ahead, and despite being drenched by the storm, she made it back to the cornucopia after approximately ten minutes. Yet just as she reached this open clearing, another cannon was heard. This was shown to belong to Malcolm after he was ambushed by Prospera, who had heard him running towards her, and she threw an axe at his head, which killed him immediately. However, shortly after continuing to sprint to the cornucopia, Prospera was attacked by another flock of macaws. Although they did not appear to harm her too badly at first, one of them pecked a vital vein on her neck, which caused her to start bleeding dramatically, and within a minute she had died. Seconds after Prospera's cannon sounded, Bloom practically collapsed into the central clearing. Another flock of macaws had been chasing him for the last minute, and they now fluttered about within the forest just beyond the clearing. Bloom then stood up in the water that almost reached his waist, and was continuing to rise from the rainfall. 
He gripped his axe firmly in his hand, whilst looking around and muttering, one left, under his breath. Bloom slowly waded around the edge of the clearing, through the intense rain, seemingly looking for any sign of the other tribute, especially on top of and around the cornucopia, whilst the flock of macaws followed him through the forest, and continued to squawk, one left, at an almost deafening volume. After travelling all the way around the edge of the clearing, Bloom appeared equally annoyed at the squawking macaws, his inability to see the other tribute, and the fact that he was now bleeding rather profusely from pecks on his wrist and neck. He muttered a rude word under his breath, and the macaws decided to squawk this word as well, which caused a cackle of amusement to break through the tense silence in Snow Square, even though this entire minute had to be muted for later broadcasts. Bloom looked ready to throw his axe at the flock of macaws, but he held back after realising that this would leave him without a weapon. He then held on to one of the nearby podiums, seemingly rather faint from blood loss. Yet as he rested, Delphine slid out from underneath the feast table, that had remained in place since the feast. It had been seen earlier that whilst Bloom was running to this clearing, Delphine had rushed to hide herself under the table, which had stopped her from being seen so far. Delphine then swam beneath the water towards the side of the cornucopia, whilst Bloom looked intently into the cornucopia, and did not appear to notice Delphine swimming beneath the surface of the water that was still being pelted by the rainfall. Bloom waded slowly towards the cornucopia, gripping his neck wound as he did so, whilst Delphine came up for breath without being noticed. Bloom soon reached the feast table as he drearily held on to it for a few seconds, before looking underneath and waving his axe around in the water with a mixture of aggression and prostration. Yet as he appeared preoccupied by this, Delphine inconspicuously swam back towards the feast table with her axe at the ready. Bloom then let out a roar, before turning to face the other side of the clearing, away from Delphine. However, just as he began to walk in this direction, Delphine suddenly emerged from the water behind Bloom, before pouncing onto his back and readying her axe. This caused Bloom to fall into the water, and he tried to bring his axe around to hit Delphine, but she quickly thrust her own into the back of Bloom's head, which made him yelp in pain. She then pulled out the weapon and gasped as blood flew up into her face. Delphine watched and shook in horror as Bloom's limp body sank through the water, and just over ten seconds later, his cannon sounded. Delphine burst into tears before holding onto the feast table to her side that had now almost become submerged beneath the water. Yet as she looked on in shock, the rainfall suddenly stopped and sunlight began to enter through the clouds above. Delphine slowly looked up, and the macaws suddenly stopped squawking. It was then announced that Delphine Dubois, of District 11, was the victor of the 92nd Hunger Games. Delphine appeared to still be in shock, and she did not react to this announcement, but she jumped when all the macaws that were in the arena at the time suddenly flew up through the trees to the roof of the arena. Over the next minute, Delphine watched in wonder as the colourful macaws flew upwards and away. When she heard some of them repeating in their squawking tones that she was the victor, she smiled and let out tears of happiness and laughter. The hovercraft then entered and airlifted Delphine to safety. Delphine had been a capital favourite, especially after she managed to create the Piranha Pit, but upon achieving victory she became an instant sensation, not only for being the youngest victor in the history of the Hunger Games, but also for being the only 12-year-old to have won. She also earned the moniker The Deadly Darling for her ability to kill that was juxtaposed with her sweet nature. For her victor's interview, Delphine was adorned in a dress of mixed green and white fabrics, whilst her hair was braided back into place and embellished with flowers that were chosen to match her dress. As for Eugenia, she wore a dress that was identical in colour to the blue and yellow of the macaws that had played a prominent part within these games. Many critics stated that the victor's interview this year was rather surreal, due to the contrast of Delphine's childlike charm with the fact that she had been responsible for the deaths of her district partner, along with two other strong competitors. Eugenia even asked Delphine what she thought of the macaws, and this led her to do an impression of them, which clearly amused the audience. Over the next few months, Delphine's attendance was requested at many capital parties, where she was escorted under the watchful eye of Easter Rolex and Geranio Landry. Although this pair had become slightly notorious for their extravagant lifestyles prior to these games, they began taking turns staying sober and keeping watch over Delphine during each gathering, and she fondly nicknamed Easter and Geranio as her other two big brothers. However, after a few months of enjoying this lifestyle, 
Delphine chose to return to District 11, only travelling to the capital once a year, in order to fulfil her duty as the mentor to District 11's female tribute, whilst Easter Rollicks took over the role of mentor to the male tribute. During her teenage years, Delphine spent most of her time living a relatively quiet life in the Victor's village of District 11 with her brothers, Serge and Gerard, although she also enjoyed spending her summer holidays alone in a cabin on a remote island within the outer reaches of Zone D in District 14. At the age of 21, Delphine got married to Aaron Campbell, a deer hunter from Zone C, before going on to have twins with him three years later.